the second path of uh, muscles and muscle tissues. And on the previous video, I have looked at um, properties of muscles, I've looked at the functions, but going ahead to look at um, type of skeletal tissues, we look at the mus the skeletal um, type of muscle tissues, we look at the skeletal muscles, we looked at the cardiac and the smooth. Then we went ahead to look at the the muscle cells, the myofibers. We looked at the myofilament. We looked at the sarcoplasm, sarcoplasm, which means a cell uh, cyto cytoplasm, just like that, right? But for muscles, we call it sarcoplasm. We looked at the sarcolemma, which means cell membrane of the muscle, and we look at sarcoplasmic reticulum which means endoplasmic reticulum in code, right? Uh, so we look at the thick and thin filament. I told you that the thick filament is made up of myosin, and the thin filament is made up of actin. It makes up of uh, tropomyosin and troponin. I told you about the regulatory proteins, that the regulatory proteins are the proteins that help to regulate uh, contraction, uh, which are troponin and tropomyosin. And I told you that the contractor protein, which are the proteins that are responsible for contraction, are the proteins uh, actin and myosin. And those are also what forms the filament based on the arrangement. All right, so I'll go ahead and talk about, now I'm beginning to look at how does the brain communicate with the muscle, muscle for the muscle to contract. For the brain, there has to be a channel of communication, right? Okay, and so that happens through the neurons. We call those neurons the motor neuron. The motor neuron are the neurons, and I told you in the last video that we have the sensory neurons and the motor neurons. The sensory neurons, we call them sensory neurons or afferent neurons. Those are the neurons that bring message into the central nervous system. Then we also have neurons that take message out of the nervous system. Uh, so it take message out. So we call them efferent neurons. And if you look at it, afferents start with A. So the CNS accept message with the afferent neuron. So A accept, A afferent. And messages exit E, the neuro, the nervous system through the efferent E neurons. All right. So the efferent neurons are the motor neurons that take message away from the muscle, from the nervous system, fix it to the muscle, right? I'll be talking about that. Now, so if you look at this, we will talk about the components of the neuron. These are the dendrites here. These are the dendrites. The dendrites receive the messages. And then, so we are looking at the motor neuron now. Then it sends the message to the soma or cell body. The soma or cell body is going to process the message. Now, it's like to receive a message that there's a fire outbreak. There's a fire outbreak. The dendrite to receive the message and then bring it to the neuron. The neuron is going to, the, the, um, the soma, rather, or the cell body is going to process the message and determine what it means. So now, by yourself, your lower limb or upper limb does not move by themselves. Like what I was saying in the last video, that's why somebody that have cardiovascular disorder, I mean, that have a cardiovascular disease, cerebral palsy, stroke, all of those, even though they see the danger, they cannot move because even though they have the modules, they cannot decide what to do without the brain. So if the part of the brain that does the communication is damaged, then there will be no action from the modules as well. All right. So the so the 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 soma process the message, and once the message is processed, it's going to come up with okay, this is the action plan you need to run. Now, what is generated here? We call it action potential. It's an impulse. So another way you can talk, you can describe action potential is to call it an impulse. You know, when you want to do something, you say, I just have an impulse to do this thing. Uh, I was somewhere, but I just had an impulse to move. And that was why I left the place before the trouble started. Uh, I was with a friend, but I had an impulse that I should just go back home. And when I got back home, I saw that my attention was needed at home. Now, so impulse, it's 
the same thing as action potential. And when you look at the word action potential, it means potential action. An action that could happen, but this is the potential for it, all right? So what the SOMA generates is what we call the action potential. So now the action potential is going to travel through the hexane, all right? It travels through the hexane. Now it will come to this azon terminal. We call this azon terminal. And at the azon terminal, there are some uh, vesicle there, which is inside the synaptic end bulb. You see that? The synaptic end bulb, all right? So the synaptic end bulb right there have some vesicles at the terminal, and the vesicle contain what we call neurotransmitter. Now, if you look at this word, neurotransmitter, it simply means a chemical that transmits the message of the neuron, all right? So these neurotransmitters here, the name of the neurotransmitter that is here is called ACH. And ACH simply means acetylcholine, all right? So that's it, acetylcholine, we call it ACH. So over time, you will see me saying ACH. ACH means acetylcholine. It's a neurotransmitter. And from the word neuro, it means it's going to be transmitting the message that is coming from the neuro, from the cell body. It's going to transmit it to the gland or the muscle that should be affected to act in the, as, it, as this case. All right. Now, when you look at this, this gives a picture um, not a perfect picture, but at least it gives a view of what the neuromuscular junction looks like. Now, at the neuromuscular junction, there is what we call the azon terminal, which I just showed you. And at the azon terminal, I told you there are a synaptic end bulb there. And the synaptic end bulbs consist, this is area, right? The synaptic end bulb consists what we call vesicle. And inside the vesicle, we have neurotransmitters. A neurotransmitter, an example of neurotransmitter are acetylcholine. Now, in this case, you see the synaptic end bulbs, you see the axon termina uh, ending with synaptic end bulbs. And here is the muscle. Here is the skeletal muscles. Here are skeletal muscles. Now, the point on the skeletal muscles where the um, somatic neuron or the motor neuron connects to is what we call the motor end plate. So we call it motor end plate. The motor end plate of the sarcolemma. Now I will explain that. The motor end plate is simply an end plate, a portion on the muscle where the neuron is going to meet with the muscle and that is what we call the neuromuscular junction the junction where the neuron and the muscle meet neuromuscular junction now sarcolemma simply means the membrane of the muscle all right so the the motor end plates are just locations in code on the muscle where the neuron is going to meet with the muscle i'll be talking about that very clearly as we go Now, when you look at this, very please come with me very carefully. Now, when you look at this, I'm still looking at the NMJ, the neuromuscular junction. And if you look at this, this again is a motor neuron bringing message and joining, combining, joining with a muscle here at the motor end plate of the muscle. All right. So here is the motor end plate of the muscle where the neuron meets with the muscles. Now, before action potential that is traveling from this neuron reach the muscle, before the action potential is sent to the neuron at the neuromuscular junction, before that time, we say that the neuron, the muscle cell, is polarized. What do we mean by polarized? We mean that the cell has more negative inside than outside. So if you are looking at it, you say the inside of the marrow fibers are negative and the outside are positive or the outside is positive so inside negative outside positive so 
we say that it is more positive on the outside than on the inside. Now, this is because of this sodium potassium pump. Now, why the sodium potassium pump? The sodium potassium pump sends sodium out of the cell and it brings sodium, I mean, it brings potassium into the cell. So when three sodium goes out of the cell, two potassium is restored into the cell. All right, so think about it that way. A cell is constantly losing three sodium and is getting two potassium back. Now, you are not looking at it about looking at the chemical configuration. We are looking at the electrical configuration. We are looking at it that three positive goes out and two positive comes in. So meaning that at every transaction, the muscle cell is losing one positive ion. That's the idea, right? Now, so that means the inside is going to be more negative than the outside because the outside is getting more positive while the inside is getting just two back when three are, are gone. Now, at this time also when the membrane is still at rest, your muscles are still relaxed. There's no action. At that time, we have another sodium channel. Though that sodium channel is closed. All right. So at that time, the sodium channel is closed. Again, the cell is polarized. More negative inside than the outside. That is polarity. All right. All right. Now. So if you look at this, you will see that. So let me show you this real quick. Now, when you, when the muscles meet at the neuromuscular junction with the neuron, there's going to be a little gap between them. That little gap we call is synaptic cleft. I've told you earlier, the motor neuron is on, uh, it meets with the, the motor neuron, the hazon of the motor neuron has a terminal end, which is filled with synaptic end bulb, which is with synaptic end bulb. And um, in the, at the synaptic end bulb, we have vesicle. So the synaptic vesicle is at the synaptic end bulb and it contains neurotransmitter, which we call acetylcholine. Now, between the synaptic end bulbs of the neuron and the muscle, the sarcomere, the sarcolemma of the muscle, there's going to be a little space. That little space is what we call synaptic cleft. Cleft simply means a little space, right? So it's a space between the neuron and the muscle cell. And that space is filled with extracellular matrix. Now, the motor end plate of the sarcolemma, which is a specialized part of the sarcolemma, has thousands of ACH receptors. So now, on this sarcolemma or on this membrane, there are receptors there. And what the receptors does is to accept acetylcholine. Now, so there are receptors, you see? And their job is simply to accept acetylcholine. So we call them ACH receptor. So HCH receptor accept acetylcholine. Now, what is going to happen once acetylcholine is released from this bulb, synaptic end bulb, and this acetylcholine gets on the receptor on the muscle cell? What is going to happen? Immediately, it's going to change the orientation of the cell, of the membrane. It's going to disrupt the membrane. That disruption of the membrane is going to cause this sodium channel that was open before to become, I mean, that was closed before to become open. Now, it's as good as this. Think about it as normally something that you will not do, but, and you are talking with a friend that you're not going to do something, but if uh, your parent just called you and said, uh, Sheila, you just have to do this, and immediately, you have just received a call from your parent. You are the receptor of the call. 
the call is acetylcholine, you are ACH receptor. You receive the call and immediately everything changes. Everything changed. And people are wondering, why did you change your mind? You change your mind because of the phone call you received. So the moment that acetylcholine comes on acetylcholine, on acetylcholine receptor on the cell membrane, the, everything about the cell membrane changed. The cell membrane that was closed before that would not cause anything, everything changes. Now, that change, the orientation changes, the membrane is disturbed. That disturbance is what caused sodium ion channel to open. All right. Now, once the sodium ion channel is open, what is going to happen? Next? So think about it. This is what we are talking about. Now, at the point when the action potential in the motor neuron reaches the synaptic end bulb, what's going to happen? Calcium is going to diffuse into the synaptic end bulb. I'll talk about that and cause the vesicle to fuse with the membrane. Now, ACH is released from the synaptic vesicle by exocytosis into the synaptic cleft, right? Now, so ACH will first be released into the cleft. What is going to happen? The ACH is going to diffuse from this cleft and attach to the ACH receptor on the motor end plate. That's what I talked about earlier, right? Now, immediately that happened, what is going to happen? You've just gotten the call from your parents and they said, now you can go ahead and do what your friend is asking you to do. Nobody knows what happened. Nobody knows the conversation. They just know that you have changed. You were, they were insisting that you're not going to do this as suddenly accepted that you're going to do it. That is what the ACH does to the muscle. The muscle will change orientation and suddenly become open. Now that opening disturbance of the membrane will cause a sodium ion channel to open. Now the sodium ion channel is going to open. Then a lot of sodium is going to rush into the cell. What is going to happen? Now, as more sodium is going into the cell, more sodium is going now than the three sodium that is coming out because this is now another channel. Now, I've talked about two pumps. Sodium potassium pump is a pump by itself. That is different. Then I've talked, I'm talking about sodium ion channel now. This sodium ion channel opens because of one reason, because acetylcholine bind to acetylcholine receptor on the membrane. Now, what does acetylcholine do? What acetylcholine did is that it brought the message from the neuron to the, ne to the muscle. So once the muscle receives acetylcholine, acet the muscle saying, neuron, I have gotten the message you want to pass across to me. And so immediately, the, 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 the muscle responds to the message by opening sodium ion channel. Now, that's the second channel. Once the sodium ion channel opens, what's going to happen? A lot of sodium is going to go into the cell. Now, once sodium goes into the cell, what's going to happen? The cell is now going to become more positive inside than the outside. Now, when it was more negative inside, we said it is polarized. Now that it's more positive inside, it has turned to opposite. So we say it has been depolarized. I, I, I hope that makes sense. Now. This really is what makes the membrane of this muscle to become imparted by the action potential that is coming from the neuron. Now, if we want the contraction not to keep going on, we want to stop it at some point, what can we do? If we don't want the action potential to get to the muscle, then we, ha we may have to go back to this synaptic cleft and remove some of the acetylcholine that was there before. Does that make sense? So because a lot of acetylcholine has been pumped here, now we need to stop. We can take out the acetylcholine to prevent it from binding to the acetylcholine receptor again. And the way to do that is to use acetylcholine esterase. From when you see ASE, you can tell that's an enzyme. So acetylcholine esterase will break down the acetylcholine that is in the synaptic cleft. Now, the only reason for that is to prevent continued contraction when it is not needed. All right? Let's go. Now, uh, let's look at, let's, let, let's continue. So the action potential that sweeps along the sarcolemma, we sweep down into the T-tubule and cause changes in the membrane of the terminal system 
of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Do you know I told you in the first video that whenever um, when you have uh, you have a T tubule and two uh, terminal cysteins, it makes a triad, and that is located in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And I told you that you should only think about that as the terminal cystine inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum is a container, then the T tubule, transverse tubule, is a straw that helps you to pump the content out. And I told you what is there predominantly is calcium ion. You remember that? Very good. Now, while so, so now we say the action potential is going to sweep along the sarcolemma, it will travel through the membrane. So once it each a particular part of the membrane, then it's going to spread out, right? It's going to spread out. Now, once it's spread out, what is going to happen? It will go to the T tubo as though going towards the sarcoplasmic reticulum so that it can affect the membrane of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Why? We need calcium to come out. I will show you how it's going to happen. So while the mouth fiber, which is muscle cell, is at rest, calcium is usually going to be inside the sarcoplasmic reticulum. It will be stored there. Calcium are not released. They are kept in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now, but the moment the action potential now reach the membrane of the muscles, what's going to happen? Calcium, calcium channel is now going to open. When calcium channel open, what's going to happen? It will leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum and come to the sarcoplasm. It's like in quote, we are saying it's going to leave the endoplasmic reticulum and come into the cytoplasm. But now we are not talking of cell, right? We are talking of muscles. So it's going to leave the sarcoplasmic reticulum and come into the sarcoplasm. Now, in the sarcoplasm, that's where calcium can do the work. Contraction is ready to happen now. See what's going to happen next. Now, calcium ion is now going to bind to troponin. Do you remember troponin? Troponin is one of the regulatory protein. Troponin is actually the lock. I told you that uh, when you have a chain, then you put a lock to lock the chain. That lock is troponin. The chain is tropomyosin. And you know, I was telling my student yesterday that it's like you put a necklace on your neck. That necklace is the tropomyosin. The lock that locks the necklace is troponin. So if you want to remove that necklace from your neck, what do you have to do? You only need to unlock it. Unlocking it is to remove the troponin so that tropomyosin can come out of your neck. All right? Now, so once you bind, once calcium ion binds to troponin, what's going to happen? Troponin and tropomyosin, the chain, the necklace is going to come, is going to fall off. All right? Now, when that troponin and tropomyosin fall off, what happened? The active site where, tropo, where myosin edge should bind to on myosin, on hatin, is going to open up. And when the active site opens, what happened? Contractions can happen. First thing is this, a cross bridge will be formed, which I'm going to show you uh, as we go. So it will, so calcium ion is going to bind to troponin and cause the troponin, tropomyosin complex to move and reveal the myosin binding site, which is active site on the heart. You see that? Now the myosin head is going to attach to the binding site and the head will shrivel, pulling the heart acting past myosin. I will explain that very clearly as we go. So like now, I've told you about how contraction happened, and I will show you a, a, a summary of it now. So the first thing here is that uh, myosin head is going to hydrolyze some ATP because ATP is required for the process, and it will become reoriented from the previous cycle, and it's energized now. The myosin head is going to bind to actin forming cross bridge. So once calcium binds to troponin, the calcium is the key that unlocks the lock. So once calcium binds to troponin, calcium ion, troponin is going to fall off. When troponin fall off, the chain is going to be removed, which is tropomyosin. Then the point where the myosin head should bind to on her chain is open. Once that point is open, what happens? Myosin comes and binds to the active site. So this is myosin head. It binds to the active site on hatin. Then what's going to happen? It's going to push it. Now, once it binds on it, this is what we call cross bridge. So cross bridge simply means the mousing head 
is bound to the active site on hatin so it's myosin actin cross bridge that's what we call cross bridge now when cross bridge forms all those contraction happen the mousing head is going to pull the actin and that is what we call power stroke so mousing cross bridge rotate towards the center of the sarcomere which i'm going to show you soon which is what we call power stroke as mousing head bind atp the cross bridge detached from it. actin and this cycle is going to continue if atp is available and calcium also is available in the sarcoplasm if we don't have calcium in the sarcoplasm there can be contraction again that tells you that calcium is not only helpful or useful in, bo in, in bone it's also useful in contraction of our muscles so no calcium no movement i will show you this process again through the image here and i want you to follow me very carefully now this is at a time when your cell is at rest when you are not moving and there's no contraction at this point you see this a mousing head this is the tropomyosin and this lock is the troponin all right this troponin tropomyosin and here the 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 like the red or the yellow this one is the actin all right now you see that troponin tropomyosin covers run like a chain all the active site where trop, where myosin should bind to now the next thing you see when contraction is going to happen is that atp uh, now you see the first thing that you see here is a calcium ion bind to troponin so you see calcium ion binds to troponin the moment that calcium ion binds to troponin what is going to happen tropomyosin uh troponin is going to re be removed and when troponin is pulled off uh tropomyosin is going to pull off as well giving space for trop for myosin head to be able to bind the active site want calcium bind that is all that mousing needs to be able to bind so you see at this point you see that atp is invested in the process at this point um the actin the mousin head fits into the actin active site on actin and that is what we call cross bridge formation again this is exposure and this is cross bridge formation now once that happens you see the pivot of mousing head so the part the mousing head fits into the active site because the active site is now open and there's access for it then what's going to happen this is going to pipe or it's going to push now that pushing is actually what we call contraction i will show it to you on the image of the sarcomere in a bit that pushing is what we call contraction and that's what we call power stroke and then once that is done contraction is over if contraction is over then uh the myosin head is going to detach from the uh process from the structure and then relaxation happen all right so let's go ahead and look at the sarcomere uh, i'll go back to one of the slides then i'll come back here now if you look at this slide this is actually what happened when contraction actually happens properly immediately at this point the cell the sarcomere is relaxed and you see this is the actin this is the actin now this is actin this is myosin you see all of these that's the head of myosin that's the myosin head that binds now when contraction when it is relaxed you see it this way when contraction is going to happen this is going to close up so this is going to slide in and meet at the m line this is also going to slide in and meet at the hemline so the level of overlapping is going to increase and the sarcomere is going to shorten that is contraction after contraction is happened as well then there will be relaxation it goes back to this all right
All right. Now, for relaxation to happen, it's simply like a reverse, a reverse of what we just did. Think about it. The first thing, if we want, if we don't want contraction to keep occurring, what is the first thing that happened that brought the message of the neuron to the muscle? It's that acetylcholine, which are neurotransmitters, arrived at the, uh, they were pumped into the synaptic cleft from the synaptic end bulbs. And then the neuro, the acetylcholine receptor on the motor end plate of the muscles picked them up, picked them up, and that disturbed the muscle membrane, which is what we call the sarcolemma. So if we don't want more contraction, then we need to stop to empty the acetylcholine that is in the synaptic end bulb. So I told you earlier, it is acetylcholine esterase that does that job. That's number one. Number two, if I don't want contraction to happen. What else after that? What else initiate contraction? It is calcium ion. I need to pump calcium ion when there's no contraction. Calcium ion is going to be in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But as it gets ready for contraction, sac calcium ion is going to be pumped into the sarco sarcoplasm. Right? So if I don't want contraction to happen, then first is I have to close the calcium ion channel. Then I have to pump back the calcium that has been pumped into the sarcoplasm back into the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum. So the active transport pumps calcium ion back into the storage in the terminal system of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So I'll just need to return the calcium ion that has been pumped into the sarcoplasm back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. The other thing is this. I can also use are some protein that we call calcium It's a kind of calcium binding protein. So it's like I'm saying, I have a lot of calcium. Uh, if I cannot pump it back into the sarcoplasm, into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, then I can decide to say, okay, calcium will ideally bind to myosin, to, to troponin, right? I don't want calcium to bind to troponin. Why not get something else for calcium to bind to and keep calcium busy, right? Now, so, uh, calcium is the one that can also bind to calcium to prevent it from binding to troponin. Now, another thing we can do uh, that's going to happen at that point is that troponin, tropomyosin, is going to bind back to the active site and prevent myosin from binding. Once there's no calcium, the active site on, on actin will be blocked. Now, this is a view of what we just uh, talked about, and I think you should go ahead and review this, having discussed it. Now, muscle metabolism, this could be due to a uh, plentiful supply of ATP needed. If there's enough supply of ATP needed, then contraction or metabolism keeps happening, right? Now, to provide active uh, transportation uh, transport during relaxation, it also helps to provide energy for contraction. Now, that's what ATP does. Now, if we also want contraction not to happen, ATP is another thing. Uh, if there is no ATP, there can be contraction. Now, three sources of ATP production, creatinine, help, phosphate help in production of ATP, anaerobic respiration, and aerobic respiration will produce ATP for us. Now, how does creatinine phosphate do that. Now, creatinine phosphate uh, makes ATP uh, by simply phosphorylation. All right. Now, excess ATP within the resting membrane module used to form creatinine phosphate in the first place. Now, three to six times more plentiful than regular ATP within the modules. And this can be quickly broken down, and its bond energy will be used to produce ATP when ATP is needed. Now, this sustains maximum contraction for 15 seconds. All right? So, ATP can also be produced. Uh, with anaerobic cellular respiration, uh, which is when glucose is broken down into pyruvate, pyruvate to pyruvate, it's a three-carbon compound, and that happens in glycolysis. 
this we call it anaerobic because it happened in the cytoplasm and it does not require energy uh it doesn't require oxygen all right so we this can happen with lactic acid fermentation we don't do um we don't do alcohol fermentation right so that can happen in that case now the other category of uh, process that can generate ATP for us is aerobic cellular respiration, which is what happened in the mitochondria, and these produce a lot of ATP. About ninety, uh, over ninety percent of the ATP produced uh, during uh, that it can be uh, can be produced from uh, food is uh, from this kind of respi uh, aerobic respiration. Anaerobic respiration simply gives you about just about four ATP, depending on on the operator. Like glycolysis, just give you two ATP. All right, uh, per glucose molecule. ATP for any activity lasting over thirty seconds is here. Either pyruvic acid, fatty acid, amino acid can be used by mitochondria. You see that to produce ATP in the presence of oxygen. This provides about ninety percent. Of ATP energy if an activity lasts more than uh, ten percent. All right. So sulfur of glucose and oxygen. We talked about that earlier. That inside the nucleus, I mean inside the muscles, there are myoglobin, and the myoglobin and hemoglobin is what supply oxygen. Then you have glucose, which is stored as uh, glycogen in the liver and also in the skeletal muscles. Now, muscle fatigue. Now, muscle fatigue, fatigue simply means tired. All right. So there is a time also, there is a limit on the muscle that the muscle becomes tired and that there's no amount of contraction you can do. There's no amount of action potential that can be that can arrive and fire the muscles to work at such point. That is the point when we say the muscle is fatigued. It's the time when the muscle is not able to respond to any form of action potential, so it's not able to contract at that point. Factors that contribute to that is insufficient release of acetylcholine uh, at the uh, at the motor, from the motor neurons at the synaptic cleft can cause that if there's inadequate acetylcholine. Uh, if there's no creatinine phosphate, that can also cause that. If there's reduction of calcium ion in the sarcoplasm, that can cause muscle fatigue. Insufficient oxygen or glycogen can cause muscle fatigue as well. Build up of lactic acid, this is key. It can also cause uh, muscle fatigue. Then central fatigue is the point when you are feeling tired and you don't have desire to stop and you're having a desire to stop an activity. This is actually a protective mechanism for our body. Is a point when you have not broken down, you are not at the limit yet, but you're already approaching the limit. And so the body is saying rest. All right. Now, oxygen depth. It um extra oxygen could be consumed by the body after sustained muscle activity stops. That is what we call oxygen depth, is the extra energy that we, that is stored in the body that's consumed after the activity that is being done stops. Now to replenish that, to pay it back, um, it has to, it's because um, of um, lost myoglobin will be the issue there, uh, lost creatinine and also removal of lactic acid from the muscles. I will stop here and continue the next uh, part three on the next video. Thank you.